Good morning and welcome. I'm Chris Stewart. I'll be your MC this morning. For those of you who have, uh, uh, who have not attended these events, we do our best to get you in and out of here in one hour. So we've got three speakers this morning. We're going to move through them pretty quick. Um, but there's a lot of material to go through. This, this is a, a fascinating um, country of interest. And um, I think you're going to be uh, real, uh, real enthused about some of the, the findings here today. I um, wanted to also let you know that we do videotape these sessions, so they will be uh, posted on the BBG website in the next um, next couple days, as well as a copy of the, the presentation, so you don't need to furiously take notes. Um, just watch, listen, and we'll have some Q&A at the end, um, so just hold your questions to the end. We're pleased to be partnered with the Broadcasting Board of Governors as we continue our monthly series on topical research findings from various markets around the world. This effort is in support of BBG's mission to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy. Today we'll look at findings from Egypt. Our next event on April 29th will focus on Nigeria. That'll also be a, a blockbuster event as well, particularly with uh, some of the findings out of northern Nigeria. I um, also want to acknowledge that uh, today with us is uh, Brian Conniff, the, the head of um, the Middle East Broadcasting Network. So, Brian, good to have you here with us. And I'm going to go ahead and make some introductions, and then we'll we'll, we'll proceed. I think at the end, bef before Q and A, we may have uh, one of the the board members of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, Mr. Michael Meehan. He may make some remarks as well. Our first speaker this morning is Mr. Bruce Sherman, Director of the Office of Strategy and Development for Bro for the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bruce Sherman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody. This is going to be, again, very brief because we do have a lot of material to work through. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of the Broadcasting Board of Governors that uh, we are, are likewise uh, pleased to be partnered with Gallup. Uh, we are uh, intent on, through these briefings and sharing with the public, uh, insights from the research we do around the world. Uh, this is, of course, taxpayer-funded research, and uh, we are uh, keen to uh, share insights uh, with a broader community. We do that um, not only because we want to make people aware of the environments that we're operating in, we also do it because there are many uh, interested groups in the countries that we reach with our broadcasts that uh, can uh, help us, in fact, understand our audiences and our markets better. So uh, part of this in reaching out is to encourage you to ask questions, uh, encourage you to be in touch with us about the work that you'll see presented here today uh, so that we can have a dialogue with you. We have begun now in these, in these briefings, for those of you who have attended these or have seen them on the web, uh, increasingly to include uh, attitudinal research that comes from the Gallup World Poll. And so the presentation today will start with a set of findings uh, related to current opinions in Egypt, and then we'll move into the media uh, data. We do that because we believe it's very important to understand not only the media environment, but understand what's on people's minds. Uh, obviously, with broadcasting that we do, our aim is to connect with audiences. We, we need to understand the platforms, the media platforms they're on, how they're using media. But of course, we also need to understand what they're thinking, what concerns them, what their issues are, what they think of the current political environment in their country. And so I think you'll see in this presentation some very interesting findings uh, that uh, provide a, a, a deeper, richer understanding of that context. And then it's in that context, the overall strategic context, political and media, that we shape our media strategies. So research at the BBG is not an academic exercise. It's an exercise to help us inform our strategies, to connect with audiences, and to fulfill the mission that, uh, that Chris mentioned. So thank you all for coming, and we'll get right into the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce our, our second speaker, Mr. Muhammad Yunus. Um, Muhammad is a senior analyst and senior practice consultant here at Gallup. He spent a significant amount of his time um, focused on the Middle East and is considered a, a public, uh, public opinion expert on Middle East um, topical issues. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Muhammad Yunus. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Uh, welcome to Gallup. Uh, for many of you, welcome back. So 
We're all excited to see the new uh, media survey data that we have just gathered in partnership with BBG from December. But to set the context, um, we thought it would make sense to share a little bit of our contextual World Poll data. Um, the World Poll, as I'm sure many of you have engaged it before, is an initiative started by Gallup in 2005. Um, really aimed at getting a pulse of what the world is thinking, um, a, a better understanding of where societies are headed, how people are evaluating their lives, the problems that people are identifying on a local level. Um, so since 2005, we've polled in about 140 countries a year, at least once a year. Um, our methodology is all based on face-to-face uh, -face polling in predominantly uh, in the emerging world. Uh, third world countries, developing countries, um, and then phone surveys in countries where phone penetration is 80% or greater. All surveys are conducted in local languages. Um, they include about 1,000 respondents per country. Um, in Egypt, we've conducted 17 surveys since 2005. Egypt is one of those countries where we've actually done a, a little bit more polling than the average country uh, across the globe. Primarily in 2011 and 2012, uh, we did about nine surveys in those two years combined, trying to get a better understanding of what's going on um, on the local level, getting beyond the, the, the classic economic metrics, a point that I'll, I'll get to later. The World Poll has really served as, as a great tool for two things, um, helping us as analysts here at Gallup and our partners across the world uh, get beyond looking at GDP numbers only, classic economic metrics and trying to understand what's happening in the country. Um, but going a little deeper on understanding how are people themselves um, expressing uh, their concerns, what are the things they're identifying as barriers to success, whether it's in the economic realm, um, well-being realm, um, on the local level, on, on the national level, et cetera. Um, all of our surveys are conducted with respondents who are 15 years of age and older. Um, our first survey in 2005 Egypt was um, among 18 years of, of age and older, but after that, um, it's 15 and older. So it's really important to kind of set the context for what you're about to see. The, la the last wave of data we collected in Egypt was about two to three weeks before President Morsi was removed from power. Um, we've actually released some of this data in uh, some other research that we've done on our website that basically shows um, how things were really heading towards the inevitable outcome that we all saw take place on July 3rd in Egypt with Morsi being removed from power. Um, but one of the most interesting things to watch in Egypt for us has been life evaluation metrics. Um, Gallup asked respondents to evaluate their lives in one of two ways, uh, or actually in response to two questions. The first question is to ask respondents to evaluate their current life on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is the worst possible life they could imagine, and 10 is the best. The second question is basically asking the same question, but for them to, uh, to guess where they'll be in five years from now. Based on your answer to those questions, so for example, if you answer a seven or higher for your life today or an eight or higher for your life in five years, you're placed into one of three categories. The best category or the highest ranked folks are in the thriving category. Um, folks who rank their lives the poorest are placed into that suffering category. Say they say, for example, a four or less on their life today and their life in five years. What we've seen in Egypt has been very interesting. Um, and what I want you to focus on is that middle line. Um, that's suffering, that's the rate of suffering in Egypt. I've marked for you where uh, we saw the January 25th uprising and Mubarak stepping down. But you'll notice that suffering was increasing rather noticeably between March of 2009 to uh, just the end of 2010. You'll also notice that that bottom line, thriving, has also been decreasing uh, all the way from 2005 straight through 2011. Now, what's interesting about Egypt in particular is right about that time, what we saw is GDP per capita in Egypt was actually improving. And that was very unique for some particular countries. Egypt was one of them, Tunisia was another, where GDP per capita was either holding steady or improving, but life evaluations were continuously declining. Right now, you'll notice in June, at least, of 2013, 34% of Egyptians fell into that suffering category. That actually put Egypt to be the highest, uh, with the highest suffering rate of any other country in Africa for 2013. But the more important point to keep in mind is this. So this was GDP and well-being, or it's particularly the thriving rate in that um, darker green color in Egypt, right around the time that Mubarak was overthrown. Completely different country, completely different situation, but here's Ukraine. And that's that thriving line, that dark green line at the bottom, continuing to plummet as GDP holds steady. So I have to be really careful and say, I'm not saying that this metric predicts stability 
um, or instability, but it's an important metric that we follow, um, and it's proved to be one of the most useful in terms of figuring out how people um, themselves on the local level are evaluating their lives, in addition to sort of following the media narrative and what people are saying in the media space. We also ask a series of questions across the world um, on national institutions and national mechanisms. So one of those is confidence in the national government. And you'll notice that from March 2011, all through the SCAF period, and really for the first half of the Morsi period, from June to about November, confidence in the national government sort of held on. Um, of course, November 2012 was when President Morsi made the constitutional decree um, that you know, aroused a lot of anger on the streets of Egypt and was really is now seen as kind of a watershed turning point moment in his presidency. Um, but a really sharp decline through June 2013 uh, in just you know, seven short months or, or eight short months uh, from 57% confidence to 29% confidence in the national government. Approval of leadership also crashed. Um, this is approving of the job performance of the leadership of this country. This is a question we ask in every country across the globe um, where we can. And you'll see that approval of country leadership also followed confidence in national government for Egypt, leading up to Morsi's removal from office. We also asked a series of questions throughout the past few years of Egypt on support for various political parties um, and groups. So we ask about support for the Freedom and Justice Party. We also ask about groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, we asked about the Noor Party, uh, the Free Egyptians Party, and a series of other smaller parties. But just to sort of drive home this point of how things have dramatically shifted in Egypt. Uh, this is support for the Freedom and Justice Party. I've demarcated for you there the post-Mubarak parliamentary elections where both the FJP and Noor Party were the first and second party to uh, clean up house in a very uh, commanding way in those elections. So you saw support for them actually, um, you know, eclipse their actual representation in parliament at 67% uh, in February of 2012. It's interesting to note that unlike support for the national government or support for the leadership, support or confidence um, in the FJP actually began to tank a little earlier in April of 2012. So it was already starting to settle in in April of 2012. It wasn't until June of 2013 uh, that Morsi was removed from office. Uh, but confidence in the FJP really declined uh, rather quickly after their uh, arrival to, to Kvarma. Confidence in elections has been a really interesting item to follow in Egypt. Um, and one of the most dramatic shifts uh, I think we've seen in the world poll on this item in any country. Not surprisingly, in 2009, and this is a great slide to demonstrate people sort of willing to express uh, an, an opinion that might not be uh, a very convenient or comfortable one to express in some countries. Uh, in March of 2009, only 28% of Egyptians said they had confidence uh, in the honesty of the electoral process in their country. Uh, that rose noticeably after Mubarak was removed from power, but then the delay in having those first parliamentary elections, we did see a lull in the confidence of the honesty of elections. We also saw a lull in the confidence of uh, several institutions in that period in Egypt. Um, but reaching a peak in uh, January of 2012 at 89%, uh, people saying they had confidence uh, in the honesty of elections, and then suddenly crashing very quickly uh, during the Morsi presidency, and in June of 2013, now only 34% of Egyptians said that they had confidence in the honesty of elections. This will be, I think, one of the most interesting items for me to look at six months, seven months later now, um, to see how people's attitudes have changed now that the presidential election, uh, electoral law is being finalized, um, and presidential elections do seem to be uh, right at the doorstep here. And then a final item uh, on the economic metrics is asking people generally whether or not the economic conditions in their country uh, are improving or getting worse. And again, very noticeable uh, increase in those saying things are getting worse. Up to 80 percent, eight out of 10 Egyptians um, in June of 2013 described the situation as getting worse economically in their country. So we've also asked a series of questions uh, about sort of pre and post Mubarak, asking people to compare their lives, where Egypt is going, et cetera, um, since uh, Mubarak has stepped down. And we've done this in a series of ways. Uh, in June of 2013, we introduced these new items, which is, do you think Egypt is better off or worse off than it was before the resignation of President Mubarak? And then, do you think Egypt in five years will be better off or worse off? 
And you'll notice that in June of 2013, 80% um, of Egyptians thought that it actually is worse off currently. So at that time, they said that Egypt was worse off since uh, the, the resignation of Mubarak, maybe not so surprising. What's a little bit more interesting is to see five years from now, still 50%, half of Egyptians think uh, Egypt will be worse off. A third think that things will improve, um, but not too promising. Uh, it, here, I'm just comparing urban and rural respondents. So when you ask about that now question, on both the five years and now question, um, urban respondents are more likely to be a little bit more pessimistic. Just to give you contrast, um, early 2012, uh, we asked another series of questions where we basically asked respondents to say whether or not they felt um, their life would improve as a result of Mubarak stepping down. 75% of respondents at the time said yes in early 2012. And we also asked whether or not they thought Egypt's standing would improve globally with Mubarak stepping down. And 80% of them said yes in early 2012. So that initial um, optimistic uh, hope for what it meant for Mubarak to step down has really shifted quite dramatically in the country, at least until June of 2013. We also asked, do you think the honesty of elections, uh, freedom of media, or employment opportunities have improved or declined since Mubarak has stepped down? And interestingly here, at least in June of 2013, uh, media was uh, the only thing that really a majority of Egyptians said had improved since Mubarak had stepped down. Honest, honesty of elections had actually declined by June of 2013, but we saw that attitudes about the honesty of elections in Egypt have ranged, uh, have really shifted very dramatically um, in the positive direction and then right back pretty much to where they were before Mubarak. Um, and then employment opportunities, obviously with the economic crisis that's ensued in the transition process, it's not surprising that most people say that economic opportunities have declined. So to, to kind of sum it up here, uh, life evaluation will continue to be a very important metric for us in sensing where uh, Egyptians see things moving in their country. Confidence in leadership, and more importantly, confidence in institutions and de mechanisms for democracy, like the electoral process, will continue to be a major factor um, in whether or not Egypt can sort of shift out of the transition phase. Um, Dr. Bob Tortora, my colleague here at Gallup, and I did a, a logistic regression on f using some of the data from this latest wave. Um, and what we found is that the most important factor in whether or not people still approved of the leadership in June of 2013 was not whether or not they supported the Muslim Brotherhood, it's actually whether or not they had confidence in the honesty of elections. So attitudes about the process itself statistically seem to be more important um, than attitudes about the leader that's in office, uh, that person themselves. Initial hope post Mubarak seems to have mostly dwindled, uh, at least at June of 2013. Obviously a lot has happened since then. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, how Egyptians assess the development since then in our next uh, survey there. And in June of 2013, perceptions on media freedom uh, were one of the only bright spots, uh, at least at that time, in people's assessments in terms of a post-Mubarak uh, look at Egypt. Um, but it's, it's also interesting to note that we're going to look at some data on media in Egypt at a time and in a country that's having a very interesting conversation about media. Um, just as somebody, uh, you know, a random consumer of Egyptian media, this week alone, I ran into two different conversations um, on two diff very prominent TV shows in Egypt um, talking about the role of media, talking about um, whether or not news anchors or uh, personalities on TV are supposed to be neutral in their presentation of the facts or not. So it's, um, it's a very interesting time to, to look at media in Egypt, and I'm very eager to, 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 to see the data. And with that, Diana, um, I think I'll, I'll hand it to you, or, or Chris, or I think you'll introduce Diana. Thanks. Thank you, Mohammed. Our next speaker is Ms. Diana Churachek, who's the Director of Audience Research for the Middle East Broadcasting Network. Uh, prior to her, her tenure at, um, at MBN, she spent 18 years in the federal government as a researcher primarily focused on the Arab world, on economics, public opinion, democracy, and a host of other issues. So please join me in welcoming Diana. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Mohammed has pointed out a number of areas of pessimism on the political and social front. And what I'd like to do now is to look at some of our more recent media data to see if there's more room for optimism on the media front, as um, Mohammed suggested. So first of all, let's look at where the data that I'm going to be talking about come from. 
Well, the BBG commissioned Gallup to conduct a national media survey of 2,000 Egyptian adults aged 15 and older. Now, we did exclude five frontier governorates because of their remoteness and also because of their low pro population, but the survey is still representative of 98% of the Egyptian population or just over 57 million adults. Now, it's important to keep in mind when the survey was conducted because obviously, um, fieldwork was conducted at a very volatile time in Egyptians' history. Fieldwork took place between December 13th and 26 December 2013. Um, this was almost six months after the removal of President Morsi, and of course there were and still are ongoing violent clashes between uh, Morsi government, former Morsi government supporters and um, supporters of uh, Sisi. Also worth noting is that one day before fieldwork ended, on December 25th, 2013, Christmas Day, the Muslim Brotherhood was declared a terrorist organization. Now one thing I'd like to point out to get started within this very volatile environment, it's um, worth mentioning that Egyptians say they still recognize the importance of media in their society. Now we see that approximately 90% agree strongly or slightly that objective and independent media are important for Egypt's future. And so this means as Egyptians seek information about what's happening in, in Egypt and even try, maybe try and influence what's happening in Egypt, they recognize that it's important to have media that is not beholden to political, economic, religious, etc. interests. Now we also ask about Egyptians' geographic interest in, um, in the media, and not surprisingly, um, a much larger percentage of Egyptians, sev approximately 70%, say they're very interested in news about Egypt than say they are very interested in news about the Arab world or the um, world in general. So given the, the importance of media in this very volatile environment, let's look at what media Egyptians are using. Now, not surprisingly, for those of you who have followed the Arab world or um, Egypt over the past decade or so, television is king in Egypt, and television remains by far the most popular source of news and information trailed by um, internet, radio, newspapers, SMS, and family and friends. Now, another thing that I think is very interesting about this chart is um, look at the dark green bars. Large, very large percentages of Egyptians say they never use the internet, radio, newspapers, or SMS for news and information. So um, indeed, this has been the case in Egypt since the BBG started conducting annual media surveys in 2006. Television, and to a lesser extent, family and friends, have been the primary source of news and information and the primary media source in general, um, followed far behind by other media sources. So obviously, given the importance of television, we're very interested in knowing what Egyptians think about it. Um, and this is a very important question because, you know, while television is definitely the most heavily used um, media source and one of the most vibrant media sources in terms of the high level of competition and the high level of um, stations to which people have access, um, it's also one of the most controversial media outlets. Um, since the Mubarak era and in successive governments, television, probably because of its popularity, has been heavily used by successive governments for political communications and as a source of propaganda. So with this in mind, we asked Egyptians how much they trust television. Now surprisingly to me, 71% say they strongly or somewhat trust television, for very high level of trust and a much higher level of trust in television than in the internet or radio. Now I have to say that I think we need to um, examine this question a little bit more closely, particularly given the timing of the survey. Um, now I mentioned that Egypt's television has always been heavily politicized, but most observers would agree that with um, the coming to power of the Sisi government, this has gone into overdrive. Um, shortly after taking power, Sisi banned all Muslim Brotherhood channels. And if you watch 
any Egyptian TV, it's very, very easy to find many examples of Egyptian stations rallying around the Sisi government, demonizing the Muslim Brotherhood, playing up the threat of terrorism from the Muslim Brotherhood, and justifying the government's takeover of power. Even um, uh, comedian Bassem Youssef, who some of you may know as the John Stewart of Egypt, has focused many of his episodes of his new program on NBC, um, the Saudi Egyptian, the Saudi channel NBC, on mocking the biased political coverage of um, Egypt on Egyptian TV. So I think that you know we might we might want to unpack this data point a little bit in the Q and A if if folks are interested. Now we also asked um, the extent to which people were satisfied with. Um, the coverage of Egypt on television. And here the results, I think, are a little bit more interesting. We still have a majority who says um, they are very or somewhat satisfied with television coverage, but we have a substantial minority, about 40%, who says they're not. And in a, in a population of about 57 million, this is more than 20 million Egyptians who aren't satisfied with the coverage of Egypt on television. And this is, I think this is very important because the, many of you may know there are many, many, many Egyptian channels vying for um, covering Egyptian local events and vying for um, viewers' attention. Now the important thing to point out about these dissatisfied viewers is that they tend to be more urban, slightly more urban, more educated, and older than Egyptians overall. But very generally, they represent a pretty heterogeneous um, slice of the Egyptian population. This isn't limited to a narrow demographic group that is unhappy with um, television coverage of Egypt. Now, one thing that I did find in the data um, about this, this population that is very interesting is that Although they're unhappy with um, the way television is covering Egypt, they're still by far using television as a, news and, uh, uh, as a source of news and information much uh, more extensively than they're using other sources of news and information. What is different about them, though, is that of all of the stations we asked about in our survey, except for Al Jazeera, the people who are dissatisfied um, are using those stations less than the, the population of Egyptians overall. So that's a, a very quick um, story about television. Television obviously is very important. It's, it's heavily utilized, but there's a substantial minority of Egyptians that's not happy with what they're getting on television. Now television obviously isn't the only media that matters in Egypt. Let's look at the internet. Um, internet is obviously used by a minority of the population, although its usage is higher among 15 to 24 year olds. It's important to point out though that internet use is gradually increasing. Additionally, it's also worth noting that the people who are, the minority who um, is using the internet in Egypt is really using it with enthusiasm and they're really taking advantage of all of the alternative information sources to which they can gain access by using the internet. Um, they're moving beyond TV. They're moving beyond these um, often politicized narratives about the environment. Um, among past week inter internet users, 80% have accessed the internet in the past week to get the latest news. Now remember the number I gave you for Egyptians overall access in the, the internet for news was about 20%. So that, that's a su substantial difference. 70% have accessed the internet in the past week to watch online video. And obviously many of these on, online videos have political overtones. Some are entertainment, but there are also many videos with political overtones. They're also heavily using social media sites such as YouTube and Facebook. Now, all of that being said, you have the substantial minority that's heavily using the internet. But all of that being said, there's a huge caveat that we have to keep in mind. Most Egyptians are still have never used the internet. Our survey shows that 73% of Egyptians say they have never used the internet. And this includes half of 15 to 24 year olds, 70% of 25 to 34 year olds, 63% of men, and 83% of women. And I think that this is important to keep in mind. You know, we talk a lot about, there's a lot of coverage of the, um, the democratizing influence of the internet. Um, and the success of the internet in creating a more pluralistic society. But I think we have to think about the extent to which that's true, given the fact that most Egyptians don't have access to, haven't used the internet.
Now, when we ask people why they haven't used the internet, it's the primary reason. It's not because they don't want to or they don't ha have access. The primary reason is they don't know how. Um, and it is true that those who don't know how to use the internet are more likely to be women than men of a mix of ages in urban and rural locations. But still, 41% of men who, are not, who haven't used the internet in the past week say it's because they don't know how. So the final um, media source that I'd like to mention is mobile phones, or mobile phones. Now, mobile phones um, access is very different from internet access. It's second only to TV in the percentage of people who have access to a mobile phone. Um, a recent World Bank report that I, I suggest you look at, it's very good, on mobile broadband, indicates that subscriptions to mobile broadband have increased much faster than subscriptions to fixed broadband, suggesting that maybe telephones um, increasingly will be a source that people can use to get news and information. We also know from our 2012 BBG data that 23% of Egyptians say they own smartphones, um, which obviously increases even more the ability of people to get access to information beyond just TV, radio, or even the internet. That being said, another caveat, um, most Egyptians are not using their cell phones to collect news. Most of them are using them to make phone calls or to a lesser extent receive and send SMS. Um, it's also noteworthy that in our survey last year, only 14% of those who said that they had smartphones in Egypt um, say they have used an app on their smartphone. And so um, the question arises, if, if they're not using apps, do they really have smartphones? And this is something that um, the BBG re research directors have grappled with over and over again. How do we ask about, self, uh, about smartphone ownership? Because there may be different interpretations of what a smartphone is. So we're a little bit cautious about the, the smartphone data, and you know, we, I, we, we're, we're cautious of any data we, f we see on smartphones. So summing up, what are the implications for international broadcasters? TV remains the preeminent news source, obviously, but many are not finding the content they want. Now this offers opportunity for international broadcasters, um, both to provide that con content, but even more importantly, to make the content that they are providing more visible. Um, those of you who, who follow Egyptian TV know the market is, is extremely crowded, and um, it's difficult for Egyptians to um, find stations to, um, that, that can provide them with the information they want to begin with. They tend to be much more interested in stations that use the Egyptian dialect and focus exclusively on um, Egyptian events. And also, I think um, there is an appeal of the sensationalism and the politicization that you see on many Egyptian channels. Now, I think that there's an opportunity to reach niche audiences through the internet and mobile phones, and there's a potential for those audiences to grow. Um, internet training, which the BBG, um, um, journalistic training the BBG is involved in in some countries, could potentially broaden the audience that has access um, and is using the internet for news. Additionally, the growth in mobile broadband could broaden the potential audience for mobile communications. Right now, these two areas are, are limited to niche audiences, but there is potential there. Now, coming full circle to my initial question of whether or not there's more room for optimism on the media side than on the political and social side, um, obviously that's a very complicated question, um, which I cannot answer definitively, but I would just say that, you know, there are signs that there is more room for optimism. Um, primarily because of changes um, to the internet, the greater use of the internet, and the greater use of mobile phones for communications. Media is perhaps one of the inter institutions in Egypt that has experienced the most significant change since the fall of Mubarak. People have more, although, although the, the percentage of those who have access to alternative communications is limited, Still, there is much more room in the media than in other I institutions for Egyptians to make their voices heard and to um, become informed with accurate and reliable information about what's happening in Egypt and what's happening in the broader Arab world. And as we've seen um, you know, over the past several years to even influence what's happening in Egypt. So thank you.
Thank you, Diana. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Meehan, who is a member of the Broadcasting Board of Governors and has been very active with the MBN Middle East Broadcasting Network as well. Um, I know that, that Michael was recently in Egypt um, and wants to make a, make a few remarks this morning. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Meehan. So a 50 degree drop in weather, is that hell freezing over or what happened? <laughs> I mean, holy cow, 23? That's nuts. Well, thank you all for braving the cold weather here in the, in the, in the March season. I put on my uh, lime green St. Patrick's Day shirt just to sort of try to add the 50 degrees back. Um, but thanks for your, uh, your work and your presentation today. And, um, you know, the board, in the, my time on the board, we've, um, you know, constantly trying to figure out uh, where to go. It's a very dynamic, um, fluid situation in Egypt. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, I was there in December. Uh, we met with some of the private television stations, uh, you know, to see on the ground. We have some amazingly uh, heroic journalists on the ground there. Um, I was there with uh, Brian Conniff and uh, uh, well, opening uh, um, a second season of um, some interesting programming that, that uh, MBN's been doing. Uh, with some young people from different sector, sections of Egyptian life. It's, uh, it's pretty fascinating uh, work that, uh, that's happened there, and I know that as a, you know, a pan-Arab television station and the work that we do both with uh, Sawa and uh, at MBN is um, inspiring to me. Um, and really, um, I was impressed just in the time I've been on the board how far MBN has come and Sawa has come uh, in terms of just being part of the culture there. The, the ability for you know, a US taxpayer funded television station to negotiate with private TVs in Egypt to get some of our programming on you know, in front of more eyeballs than you might normally get. I mean, clearly our experience during the, the, uh, the politically correct situation around January of 2011, I guess, <laughs> depending upon which side you're, uh, you, you point to. But, but our our team there and the work that everybody does um, at MBN and at Sawa um, uh, on their programs, uh, they get Egyptian politicians coming on to these shows now. They, there, there is a level of credibility in, in the reporting and the work that's been earned over time, um, you know, given the circumstances there. Um, you know, we, when we went, we stayed at the, at the Marriott and, for, you know, two weeks later, the Egyptian government was arresting journalists at the Marriott for doing journalism. So, you know, it's a very tough situation that people are in, and, a, and I'm mindful as we think about these things on the board about the best way to do, um, to do the to do the work that we do. Um, that that this is these are very challenging times, and they're in a very challenging situation there as well. Um, we sat with uh, we sat with the State Department folks who had done some recent polling about the attitudes of of the U.S. in in Egypt. Uh, and they'd gotten there three years ago, and it was at 18, and now it's at five. So they're, they're <laughs> it's been it's just a really tough time period for, you know, what the right thing for for we as Americans who uh, uh, support, you know, these public diplomacy journalistic efforts in in the region um, uh, to do our work. But uh, I want to thank everybody for their hard work here um, uh, in, 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 doing, in doing the polling and the insights. It certainly helps, uh, you know, I've been leading an initiative to try to get additional funding to in improve local streams uh, in terms of the media and the work there. And, uh, you know, in a tough budget environment here in Washington, that's been a bit of a challenge. But it's still important for us to continue to make some progress on. So thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you all for your hard work, my colleagues up here on the board. And, um, I'll let you get back to the presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. We now have uh, some time for questions. My colleagues have microphones. If you just state your name and your organization and uh, who, who your question might be directed towards. Right here. We've, we've got a mic coming to you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, uh, I, I think, for both speakers. Um, the first is more technical, and the second is more political. Uh, the first is, um, how do you ensure that your sample is fairly random and representative of the Egyptian 
uh, population at large. Um, the second question is that uh, Al Jazeera has been a very controversial but influential channel. I didn't hear anything about Al Jazeera. Was it covered at all or did it, did it come in your uh, survey? Thanks. I can answer the Al Jazeera question um, quickly. Yes, there has been a lot of um, controversy surrounding Al Jazeera, and we did ask about it in our media survey. Um, we have found that the reach for Al Jazeera, as well as the reach for um, many other international and pan-Arab broadcasters, has declined. But um, according to our survey, um, Al Jazeera is still the most popular non-Egyptian television station in Egypt in terms of past week viewership. And in terms of the way the sample is gathered, um, actually, if you want more detail, there's something called the World Poll uh, Methodology document on our website, gallup.com. Um, but just so you know, it's, it's in Egypt like it is in the rest of the globe. Uh, it's based on the latest census data in the country. Um, it is definitely aimed at being nationally representative. For Egypt, um, there are some governance where we don't poll the border governance. It eliminates about 1.8% of the population. But other than that, um, it's, uh, it's you know, mirrored to represent the way that the Egyptian population looks in terms of age, uh, rural, urban, dwelling, uh, income levels, uh, you know, whether you're literate or illiterate, a PhD, or um, you know, somebody who you know, can't read or write their name, you have an equal chance of being interviewed. It's not a poll of Cairo and Alexandria. Um, it, it really is a nationally representative sample of Egypt. And Egypt actually is, um, you know, uh, one of the places where uh, we have one of the highest response rates uh, for the World Poll. So the Middle East generally, the response rates are astronomically high, usually above 70%, uh, with the exception of Morocco and Israel for some reason. Um, but Egypt is actually usually in the low 90s in terms of people very actively wanting to express their views and what they see uh, happening around them. But the, the, the World Poll document is on, uh, the, the methodology document is on the website if you want to get into the more technical details. Great. Next question. Right there. Uh, thank you very much, Dan Srebny from the State Department. Um, excellent presentation. I have one question for each of the panelists, for, for Mr. Yunus. Um, among the institutions and confidence indicators you talked about, you didn't mention military. So if you could cite any statistics on, from the most recent polling on that. And uh, for Diana, um, in terms of media use in Egypt, do you have any information that might correlate with indicators of um, population that is most active either in civil society or in the political process as a particular audience. Thank you. Great. Uh, so in terms of uh, national institutions, we did ask uh, questions about the military in Egypt we have for several years. We didn't ask it in June 2013 because we actually ended up wanting to ask other questions about what was happening in the country. Um, but the military actually has been, and SCAF specifically, we actually added another question just on SCAF. Those two have been uh, among the institutions that receive the highest approval ratings consistently. Um, even at times when things were not going well for SCAF at all in Egypt, confidence in the military remained at about 90%. Um, it actually looked very similar to, to the U.S. metric for confidence in the military. So um, SCAF and, and the military generally have been uh, one of the national institutions where we haven't seen confidence waver uh, so much. I, I would imagine now, um, obviously, that, that could have changed, but it, it also might not have. It was very surprising to people to see the support for SCAF in the military um, at some points in, in 2011 and 2012. I remember sharing some of that data uh, around town and, and in the region, and people were really sort of wowed by that. Um, but I think events later proved that you know, the military uh, certainly understands its market and they know how to, uh, how to stay on the right side of, of, of most people, at least in, in the polls that we're conducting. Yeah, um, we do have some questions that can give us insights into the extent to which those who are using various media are involved in civil society. We don't have a lot of questions, but we ask questions such as, um, to what extent do you share information with your family and friends? To what extent 
Um, do you, we, we have questions to ask about the extent to which people collect news. So we can, the people who collect news more frequently and who pass on news more frequently um, could be seen as uh, those more active in civil society. So we do have a few questions that can get at that, some of those insights. Okay, next question, right here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's, uh, it's very interesting uh, to get such insightful information about my country. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, because it's, uh, it seems interesting uh, regarding the media and the television usage, did you happen to have like a more depth information about what type of uh, uh, television uh, uh, viewing, I mean like do they watch news or they watch TV series? Because being an Egyptian, I know that most of uh, the Egyptians are not watching TV for news. They are watching it either for talk shows or for uh, drama. And this is very significant and very impactful if you want to do some uh, uh, campaigning or uh, public awareness. My other uh, point is, did you happen to have also some breakdown of uh, the TV sources? I mean, is it public TV? Because you were talking about uh, politicizing the TV. Uh, we, we might agree or not that usually the, 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 the public one is more politicized than the private, but it, uh, it's, it's interesting to know the tendency of, uh, of uh, who, who watch what and the, the demography of who watch what. Uh, the last question for Mohammed is, you mentioned that, uh, my understanding that the last poll or the last survey you did it on tw June thir uh, 13th, is that right? Yeah, June 2013, about, yes. about two, two and a half weeks before. Uh, Since then, you haven't done any surveys? No, so we're, ho we're hoping to go to field uh, relatively soon for this uh, year's It work. would be interesting to see how the tendency uh, develops in most of the correlation between the GDP and the, uh, and the thriving and, and the prospect in the next five years. That's very interesting to know. Yeah, definitely, because the narrative has certainly shifted. Yeah. Um, yeah. The attitude has shifted. Right. Um, so right. I'm, I'm extremely yeah. eager to... It's interesting, though. Thank you. Take a look at that data. Um, on the, the other questions, yes, it is true that um, Egyptians, as I think most people, tend to watch entertainment more than news. Um, we do know, however, we ask Egyptians um, the extent to which they're interested in different topics on television. And the largest by percentage by far says that, says that they're interested in news. So they might not be watching news all the time, but they say they're more interested in news than healthcare, than um, sports, technology. I can't remember what the other categories are. Um, and, and I also think that there's an interesting dynamic in Egypt. Um, you know, you, you, I'm sure you've noticed the entertainal, entertainmentization, I don't know how you'd use that, of news broadcasts. I mean, why is Bassem Youssef so popular? Because he's, he makes news entertainment. Even, you know, Ibrahim, Ibrahim Issa and um, what's the guy on El Farain, Taufik Okasha, um, they're entertaining. And, you know, people, do people watch them because they like what they're saying or do people watch them because they're fun to laugh at and they're, they're entertaining? So, um, you know, I think that, that that is definitely true and that's probably a trend that we see, you know, we see that in the United States too. We probably see it in, in other countries. In terms of the breakdown of what channels people are watching. The most popular channels, and this has always been the case since, as I said, since we started conducting surveys in Egypt in 2006, the most popular channels are always the Egyptian channels, you know, the Al Hayat, the CBCs, the Al Tahrir, the Al Nahar. Um, but when we ask about news, um, the the most popular stations tend to be, um, well, Al Jazeera is still very popular, but Al Hayat is popular for news as well. So, so there's a mix. And, and you were making a point on Al Jazeera earlier that just because people are following it, it doesn't mean they sort of, it's like the Rush Limbaugh thing. Yeah. You can watch something you don't yeah. like regularly to know what they're saying, but not necessarily agree with what's being said. And the other thing about the media surveys we conduct, I mean, the media surveys that we conduct in Egypt have about 140 questions, which is a lot of questions. Um, you know, you go into people's houses and you interrupt their day for an hour, and most people don't have an hour to, to sit and answer questions, but they do because they're, they're very nice and um, they like to have their, their opinion um, expressed. But we can't get into a lot of detail in terms of, um, you know, why people are watching different television stations. For, um, we know very generally that, um, 
you know, in Egyptians are more interested in entertainment than they are in news, but they're still very highly interested in news. But we don't ask a lot of follow-up questions in terms of, um, you know, do you watch do you watch this program on Al Jazeera for for news? Do you um, do you like this program on Al Jazeera and not like this program on Al Jazeera? Do you trust this program on Al Hayat and not trust this program? So there are a lot of questions that we can't get into in these national surveys, and that we tend to look into more deeply in qualitative research. I just wanted to add that you know thinking about the media space in Egypt um, is particularly fascinating from Washington for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that Egypt really right now is whether, you know, depending on your politics or irrespective of your politics, it's really having a post 9-11 moment. Um, the average Egyptian is more scared now um, about terrorism than they have ever been in their re re sort of recollected history. Um, so that's definitely playing a role. And the reason I say it's fascinating from Washington is because the media narrative in this country uh, really took on a very interesting kind of turn after 9-11. Um, and certainly through the Iraq war. So it's, it's been interesting to me to sort of compare and contrast um, the media reaction in, in primarily in Cairo to the media reaction in the US uh, with, with regards to the terrorism thing. The other thing is, as the media space in Egypt has opened up, um, and f from everything Diana sort of just described about it it, it, it seems like it's just looking more like the global media space. Um, I mean, media that's beholden to political interests religious interests or economic interests, that sounds to me like a lot of the media here in the US or in Europe. Um, you know, the idea of a neutral person to kind of tell you the truth of the news is, is very much kind of a lost thing in many societies. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't know where to go to get that here in the US, maybe, maybe you know, PBS or something. And I think that's, you know, when we ask about the Egyptians' favorite media sources, that's why we always see family and friends as uh, an important source of media, the most important source of after TV. And the question I have, um, which remains to be answered, is um, to what extent will um, mobile phones, for example, become a proxy for that news? Er and, or to what extent are they already becoming a proxy for that exchange of news between family and friends? And that's something that you know, we don't really have a handle on right now. Next question, right here. My name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with the Center of Egyptian American Relations. Uh, one comment about what Mohammed said about uh, Egyptian people like the military, 90%, and that's true, because the military is is us Egyptian people. Is I serve three years. Everybody serve everybody in Egypt have father or son or yeah. or or or, uh, uh, or brother yeah. or everybody in the military. That's why it always will be 90%. It's not because they are doing great job. SCAF, I have doubt about the numbers. Probably it's, it's, it's low now, right now. Uh, the second thing about the media, we, we didn't discuss the freedom of media, freedom of speech in the media, which uh, during Morsi time, and I'm not supporting Morsi for say, but during Morsi time, he never closed anything or maybe stopped one station and came back, but he never closed any media. He never stopped or arrest anybody but was questioned about Basim Yusuf one time, but he uh, conducted 29 episodes without any closed one episode. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we know now he had two episodes and then they stopped him and he came back and is a questionable every week and so on. Then the freedom in, in the speech in Egypt is different. Uh, we have uh, state media, majority, and all private media working equally to the state because they are, all of them, they receive their yeah. uh, message from the military. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's the truth which we know. There is no freedom in the, in the media, which is disaster, but that's what the Egyptian people listen to. Yeah, can I, can I comment on that? Um, first, let me comment from the data. Uh, actually, one of, the, one of the data points I did show was that the, at, in June of 2013, uh, most Egyptians said that freedom of media had improved since Mubarak. Um, and, and then, I, I, if you recall, I mentioned it would be interesting to see where that's gone. The other thing is freedom of speech. Um, e Egypt, we've asked a series of questions all across the world about if you were to um, div div draft a constitution for a country, um, sort of theoretically, which of these freedoms would you sort of insist would be in that constitution? And freedom of speech is one of the things we ask about. And Egypt, Egyptians have been very consistent at very high rating supporting 
the concept of freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is, is not arguably sort of, you know, not something Egyptians want, or it was certainly a big part of the January 25th movement. Um, it was certainly a big part of sort of the Mubarak's last years in opening up the media space from 2007 uh, through 2010. So the, the, the data definitely does play out that people had a positive perspective on where the media had come until the middle of June in 2013. That's where, that's where the data is. I also think that, you know, when we're talking about data, um, we're making generalizations. When we're talking about national surveys, we're making generalizations. So um, the issue of media freedom, I mean, I think that there are, there are areas where you can find, even on television, there is more media freedom, and then areas where perhaps there's less media freedom. Um, if you look at um, Yusri Fauda, for example, I mean, he's used television um, as a platform to protest some of the CC government's um, attacks on protesters. And that's, that's, that's pretty remarkable that he's still on TV, but he's, 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 you know, he complains about the military's intervention on Twitter and, and in other places. So um, even on TV and, of course, in the Internet and, um, you know, with mobile phones, there is, you know, there's, there's kind of a push and pull. So, um, you know, you one step forward and one step back. But there are definitely um, signs that, there's more room for dialogue than there was before. Although I don't, I mean, I think that there's a, a difference, there's definitely a difference between the conditions under CC and the conditions under, um, under Morsi. The, the television environment, at least, is much more, well, not just the television environment, is much more restrictive. But that doesn't mean that people can't get their, their messages out. They just have to find different ways. And that's also, you know, in, in, not in all fairness to anyone, just to make it clear, you know, a lot of the messages that were being shared on Egyptian media um, were not ones that were supportive of freedom of speech or freedom of expression or a difference of opinion. I think the challenge is not having more voices. Um, the idea is really to encourage a space where uh, you know, a difference of voices can be heard. So a lot of what was happening on many of the stations that got shut down at, at the end of uh, Morsi's time in office quite frankly, would not have been protected speech here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we need to, that was also a component of what happened. That doesn't mean that a lot of people got shut down that weren't doing that. But, you know, in, in just to kind of live in reality, a lot of what was happening on those stations, it, you know, it wouldn't fly in, in, in Western Europe or the United States because it primarily was an incitement to uh, violence, prime, an incitement to intimidating people at the media center, um, an incitement to all kinds of activity that isn't usually considered as protected speech. But that's not to say a lot of other protected speech was, was clearly shut down. We've, we've got time for one more question. Back to you, sir. I have uh, two, but very short ones. Uh, why did it take you seven months or eight months to reveal information of something you collected in June? The second question is that why in your cares there was no impact of the Supreme Court of Egypt declaring the parliament as null and void. Yeah, actually, um, the answer to your first question is we didn't. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see that we actually, some of this data, uh, we released it um, um, maybe in August. So it, we, di we didn't wait. It's just that we had this event, so we wanted to share some of our data from June. Um, your second question was, yeah, so we did actually see an impact. I mean, if you see uh, from when the, uh, constant, the parliament was dissolved, uh, confidence in the honesty of elections declined dramatically. Um, so that could arguably be one outcome of uh, one of the highest courts in the land coming out and declaring the whole process void, is that people actually, surprise, surprise, lose confidence in the process. Um, so that could be one of, one of those indications. I'm not sure what kind of other indications you would be uh, looking for. Support for FJP also declined after the dissolution of parliament. Absolutely. But uh, you know, like all things that have occurred, in, this is a great point. Uh, as all things that have occurred in Egypt since 2011, um, events tend to follow sort of where the street is moving. So at the time that the parliament was announced dissolved, it certainly had a lost a lot of credibility at that point in history um, in, in its lifeline. So, you know, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg. 
Uh, it, it, does the data look that way because the court made that decision, or did the court make a decision that was growingly a popular one as time was passing by? Great. Just one point of clarification. So the, the World Poll Survey was cut, conducted in June of last year. The media survey that Diana talked about was conducted in December, and that's in your, your briefing documents. It'll also be in the, in the presentation that will be posted along with the video on the, the BBG website in the next couple of weeks. Um, please join me in, in one final round of applause for our, for our speakers, and they'll be here for a few minutes after if you have any questions. I just wanted to, to do one final promo on the April 29th event on Nigeria. That'll be a, a blockbuster event, so hopefully we see you back for that event, and let's give the, the speakers a nice round of applause. <laughs>